This is Letters in Politics. I'm Mitch Jezrich. We now turn to Emanuel Wallerstein, author of a number of books. He's a sociologist, a historian, and world systems analyst. He gave an address at last weekend's Left Forum in New York City, which is the largest annual gathering of leftists in North America. This is Emanuel Wallerstein. The message we are hearing is that the world is going to pot and very fast. And I entirely agree. (laughs) However, the real question is, what should we do about it? Now, I just gave a, a, a session called Conversation with Me, in which I spoke for a half an hour. I spoke for a half an hour condensing what I should have taken several hours, if not more, to say, and I cannot condense it further. Uh, But I have to tell you uh, the bottom line of what I said in order to talk about the issues that have been raised today. All systems have lives. That's true of the tiniest system that we can conceive of to the entire universe. They come into existence at a certain point for certain reasons, and that has to be explained. Uh, They have a normal life, and they have rules that govern this normal life, and they have to be elucidated, and they have internal contradictions which culminate at a certain point such that the system is in structural crisis, which means it cannot survive as that and there's a bifurcation and uh, two alternative uh, uh, possibilities. Now, I'm not going to explain to you the whole logic behind that that argument, but what I am saying, have been saying for quite some while, is that the world, the capitalism is a world system, that this system has been incredibly successful for 500 years, that it has now Uh, reached a point where it is in structural crisis. It will not, cannot possibly survive. It's it's been in structural crisis. Yeah, it's not a matter of applauding because it's just, it's it's a factual statement. It's not, it's not a, a statement of desire. It's a statement of what is happening, right? Uh, and this system, This system has been in structural crisis since at least the early 1970s and will be in structural crisis for another 20 to 40 years. I project 2050 is sort of the end of it. That whole period of time is a period of structural crisis and therefore of chaos. And chaos means enormous fluctuations that are uncontrollable and uh, a bifurcation into two alternative outcomes. One alternative outcome, I just give them names. I call one the spirit of Davos, one the spirit of Porto Alegre. And the spirit of Davos is to have a new system which is not capitalist, you don't have to be capitalist, but which shares the three basic faults of capitalism, which is hierarchy, uh, exploitation, and polarization. You can do that in many ways. Capitalism is only one way you can do that. And these people want to replace capitalism. It has to be replaced by something because it's no longer working for capitalists. And they are no longer able to really make significant uh, profit and therefore significant capital accumulation. So capitalists want the end of this system as much as we do. But they want to replace it with a system which ha- ha- uh, meets their demands. We want to replace it with a system that's relatively democratic and relatively egalitarian. We're not democratic now. There is no democratic state in the world system. There has never been a democratic state in the world system. We're certainly, we're certainly not an egalitarian system. So uh, this is our basic choice. I tried to outline uh, the political complexities of, of struggling uh, uh, to have it tilt in one direction rather than in the other. Okay? Now, by 2050, we'll be in a different system. But it may be worse than the system we're in now, and it may be incredibly better. And the odds 
are 50-50. Now, those are pretty good odds, actually. But there's nothing I can say or do or you can say and do that will guarantee that we'll win. It's just a matter of struggle. Now, there are what I call the three imponderables, which we've been talking about uh, so far. Um, one imponderable is, roughly speaking, the environmental crisis. One imponderable is pandemics, and one imponderable is nuclear warfare. Now, look, all of those have their roots in the capitalist system. Of course, they are the outgrowth and the consequence of the system. Uh, nonetheless, they have a certain internal life. I wrote an article 15 years ago uh, saying uh, there's this environmental crisis and there's no exit from it within the framework of the capitalist system. Because the, let's just take one kind of uh, part of that uh, environmental crisis. All production, all production of any kind creates toxicity. And the question is what you do with the toxicity. And in the capitalist system, what you do is you dump it in the river. Huh? No, no, that's quite serious. You literally dump toxicity in the river, right? You can do many other things, right? Now, the problem is, over time, if you dump for 500 years, you get to the point where the rivers are not viable for the fish, for people, for anything, right? So what can you do about it? Well, you can clean it up, right? Uh, that is to say, governments can make the decision that they have toxic environments and they're going to spend money cleaning it up. Question is, where do they get that money? Obviously, the place they get that money is from some form of taxation or choosing not to do X and to do Y instead, right? Uh, and then, and then they say, if we do that, it doesn't make any sense to have people throwing the stuff in the river again. So we have to force, by legislation of some kind, the internalization of costs. That is to say, the people who produce the toxicity have to clean it up. And the capitalist entrepreneur will say to you, quite correctly, that if you force me to internalize that cost, I cannot make a profit. He's right. He's absolutely right. And that's why right, there's no exit within the structure of the system. Right? You, a system that's built on the endless accumulation of capital cannot get people who have power to do things which will ruin them. And doing those things will ruin them as capitalists. Okay? So, of course, they resist and they're politically strong, and so forth and so on. You may win battle here and lose battle there on particular items and so forth. But basically, as long as we're in the framework of a capitalist system and not in a democratic egalitarian system, you can't, you can't solve that problem. You can, you can treat it in a limited way, and that may be a virtue. That is to say... Uh, I'm all for stopping this and stopping that and, and, and so forth without any illusion that that will transform the system. Now, if you take pandemics, pandemics emerge or for, for many reasons and the combination of all of those reasons. Yes, of course, medical care is distributed totally unequally, right? So some people get excellent care and most people get lousy care uh, and some people get in-between care. That, that's one of the problems and that cu accumulates. So the people who get lousy care are more susceptible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in addition, we have a system in which after all, in order to solve uh, the medical problems, you have to do kinds of research that will en enable us to figure out 
uh, what a new vaccine is or what a new this or a new that. Now, of course, obviously, who, who does that and for what? And there are companies who do that for profit. So they only do it on some things and not on others, They're et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have the problem of, of, of the physicians and prescribing, right? So there's the, there's, there's the idea of the overprescription of all kinds of medicines, which then create the mega bugs, which you, you then would get into the historic 100,000-year-old, um, uh, if not longer, struggle between plagues and people, between germs uh, and humans. Uh, and we're in the middle right now of a major crisis, I think, of megabugs that is not at all clear that we're going to solve. And then there's nuclear weapons, right? Uh, let's talk about this. Nuclear power is another question, nuclear weapons. Now look, why do people have nuclear weapons? Well, the United States got nuclear weapons first, and they were going to use it as a monopoly, a quasi-monopoly of geopolitical power. They gave it to Britain as a junior partner, but nobody else. The, the Soviet Union defied them and got theirs, then France and, and China got theirs, then India, Pakistan, Israel, South Africa, and et cetera, got theirs. What's the point from a, a, a state of getting nuclear weapons? It's not an offensive weapon, it's a defensive weapon. If you have even two nuclear weapons, which is probably what North Korea has at the moment, it's enough to stop uh, an invasion. Because with two nuclear weapons, uh, if they drop one of them, just one, on Seoul, not only will it wipe out God knows how many South Koreans, but also how many Americans and how many Japanese and so forth and so on. So it is a tremendous defensive weapon. And therefore, I give you my absolute prediction that by the year 2020, we will have 25 nuclear powers at least, at least in the world, right? Okay, because everybody wants this nuclear weapon as a defensive weapon, okay? And it's perfectly rational. If you are Iran, think of it. Just put yourself in the place of Iran. There are, what is it, nine other known nuclear powers in the world today. Eight of them are within range of uh, hitting Iran. Only one, North Korea, is not in range, okay? Now, if you're sitting in the, in the seat of government of Iran, is it irrational to say we should have a defensive weapon? Of course it's not irrational. Any, any sane Iranian leader would do it, and they will do it. The one thing I believe when the U.S. says it, is that they're lying through their teeth when they say they don't want to develop nuclear weapons. Of course they do. And they will. They will because, uh, I can't go into the whole geopolitics of it now, they will, right? And what it, will, what, what it changes is geopolitical alignments. So it, it weakens Israel, there's no question about that, and it strengthens uh, Iran, and it tr strengthens uh, various other governments and so forth. And all this is part of a situation in which the U.S. no longer has the power to stop this, does not have that power, but no one else has the power to control the situation. So we have, in fact, a chaotic geopolitical situation in which there are eight or ten or twelve centers of power, right, vying with each other. Now, look, the real question before us, if, if, if we say that we're going to have a new system in 2050 and it all depends on us and what we do about it and so forth and so on between now and then, is whether what I call the imponderables will in fact explode, so to speak, before 2050. Anyway, if, if the other side wins, uh, they will explode. That's, that's no question. But before somebody can really stop it,
because now nobody can really stop it, okay? And um, let's take them one by one. Environmental change, well, the most dramatic part of that is climate change, and everybody is talking about climate change, and the figures are devastating and, and so forth. However, among people who are not denialists, who are serious uh, are scientists, who accept uh, the reality of human intervention as behind basically the, uh, the, the climate change problem, uh, et cetera, there is varying views about the speed of it and also the, uh, the compensatory aspects if you lower the, uh, if you make one area warmer, will you make another area cooler? Will you shift agricultural production or et cetera, et cetera? The whole question is how fast this will go. And the answer is, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Other people may be sure. Okay? Pandemics, right? Uh, I, I think it's very dangerous, but how dangerous? Is, is the great pandemic that's going to wipe out half of human population going to occur in 2032, or is it scheduled to occur in 2062? I don't know that. And I don't think you know that. Uh, nuclear weapons. Yes, they're a great defensive weapon for a state. But there are other people. You have non-state organizations who don't have the same necessity to survive that a state has. And who, Al-Qaeda is just one possibility, who want these weapons and want to use them because whatever. Uh, we also have the possibility of Dr. Strangelove. Look, if President Obama were to decide to drop a nuclear weapon on some country, he makes the decision. He doesn't push the button. He calls somebody. I don't know by what mechanism. Some communication to some general sitting somewhere in some bunker and says, now you push the button, right? Now that general is supposed to only push the button if he gets the communication from the President of the United States. Well, we, we had a whole uh, famous Dr. Strangelove uh, book that was very successful and so forth, and it's not impossible. It's not impossible that some either not or some person who has a particular ideology happens to be sitting on that button and pushes the button without the President of the United States telling him to push the button. So Dr. Strangelove is a possibility. It's unpredictable, but there are humans involved in this process, right? It's not just the heads of states that are involved in this process. It's supposed to be just the heads of state. It's, uh, that's why you have this, the red telephone, famous red telephone between US President and the Soviet Union during all those years. It was to prevent mistakes, but mistakes could possibly happen. So let me, let me summarize all that. All right, we have these imponderables. What we don't have is the timing on the imponderables, right? And if any of them were to occur before the end of the bifurcation process, right, it would, of course, affect the outcome. One of the uh, possibilities in the, the bifurcation process is that we will still have a world system, just a different world system. But another possibility is we move into multiple small systems, as we had in the world, for, for all, all of human history, uh, we had a multiplicity of coexisting uh, different kinds of systems. It's only very recently that we've had a single a world system. So it's quite clear that if you wipe out half the world through a pandemic or through a nuclear 
operation or through a collapse uh, of the climate, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What you end up with is a different kind of world uh, into which we are creating whatever we're creating at the end of the bifurcation. Look, in Latin America these days, they talk a lot about uh, buen vivir. Buen vivir is itself a translation from uh, Quechua and, and, and from uh, other uh, uh, indigenous languages of the Americas. And what is buen vivir supposed to mean? It's supposed to mean something like this, that uh, growth per se is not a virtue. Growth is a cancer. What is a virtue is reflecting rationally and carefully on our ladder of values and what we want to preserve and what we don't want to preserve. Now, I often use the example in discussions about so-called development of Denmark. Denmark is a small country. In the middle of the 19th century, it was what we consider to be a backward country. It was a poor country, right? Now, what, whatever process they used for state development, it's, it worked. Denmark comes out on the top or nearly on the top of every conceivable measure, including that of the welfare state within Denmark. Right? Okay. That's a very, very expensive thing to do. The, if the whole world were Denmark, we'd go under. But everybody wants to be Denmark. There's no country you can go to and say, well, sorry, there's no room for another Denmark. You can't become a Denmark. So in point of fact, the reality of the world is that if we want to survive, we have to have a civilizational change. And the civilizational change means, for example, that our real standard of living as we now measure it in terms of commodities has to go down everywhere, but especially where it's high. Now, that isn't an easy message to purvey and it isn't one that immediately is going to rally the troops everywhere, but it is a realistic reality. We cannot all be Denmark. The world doesn't have space for it. It doesn't have space. It doesn't have resources. It, doesn't, it just, just can't do it. That's why we're fighting everywhere now over water. Water, you can't live without water. Well, at the moment, some people are living without water, and there's a struggle going on so that more people will be living without water in order that some people over here live with, live with water. Well, you know, there isn't enough water for 9 million people, billion people who are living like Danes are living today. There just isn't. So we have to agree on living at, in a different way, a buen vivir, which requires a civilizational change that is a much greater transformation than merely uh, solving some of these problems. Uh, 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 let's, let's just take carbon emissions. I mean, I'm all for carbon, uh, limiting carbon emissions. Uh, tell it to the Chinese. I mean, the Chinese say, yeah, but we're behind. What does behind mean? It means we're not living at the standard of living of the United States, right? There's no reason for us to live at a level below that of the United States, right? So you've got to either give us all that you have, 50% of what you have, or you've got to let us do this or so forth. And that's why no agreement has been reached and no agreement will be reached between the United States and China about carbon emissions. That's just one of the multiple examples of the impossibility of resolving this 
within the framework of the capitalist world system. So, there's my message. And that was Emmanuel Wallerstein speaking last weekend at the Left Forum in New York City. Special thanks to Ernesto Aguilar and Alan Minsky, who covered the event for Pacifica Radio.